Welcome back everyone, this is Professor Herring. In this video, we're going to be looking at molecules in three dimensions. This is going to build on what we learned about Lewis structures by applying the electron pair repulsion model, also known as VSEPR. And that's going to help us to determine what these molecules look like in three dimensions, describing their electron domain and molecular geometries. We're then going to look at what happens when you have lone pairs of electrons or multiple bonds, and then finally, we're going to look at large molecules and, and analyze the shapes of larger molecules. Let's begin. When we look at a Lewis structure, this is for CCL4, carbon tetrachloride, we could draw it in two dimensions, flat on a piece of paper or a screen, and it looks like that the bond angles between each bond are 90 degrees. And it looks like we're kind of in the shape of, a, of a, an X or, or a square if we draw the, draw, we can draw a box around it. It turns out, however, applying the valence shell electron pair repulsion model, or VSEPR, that we can more accurately predict what's going on. And what experiments have been done to illustrate is that it actually has this three-dimensional shape where the bond angles are much different than what we might predict just by looking at the Lewis structure. The key takeaways from the VSEPR model are that electrons want to stay as far away from each other as possible. Remember, electrons repel electrons in the same way that protons repel protons. And so there, the elements within these molecules have to be close enough to each other because they're in bonds, but they want to be as far away as from each other as possible to minimize the repulsions from the electrons. We also see that lone pairs take up more space than shared pairs, as, as well as multiple bonds. And we'll take a look at what that means in just a little bit here. Let's start this discussion by talking about an electron domain. And this is a, a region of space where there's a high probability of electron density. Each bond represents one electron domain. And it's important to note that this is independent of the bond order. So it doesn't matter if we have a single bond or a double bond or a triple bond, they all take up a single domain. We've also looked at lone pairs of electrons, also called unpaired electrons. Those represent also an electron domain. And then finally, if we have uh, lone pairs on bonding atoms, then that also represents an electron domain. So just to clarify here the difference between these two, this is if we look at a single electron or if we're looking at a lone pair. When, when we talked about exceptions to the octet rule where we had odd numbers of electrons, that's where this might come into play. So when we look at carbon tetrachloride, it has four domains, one for each bond. Now if we wanted to look at a given chlorine atom on it as well, it turns out that it also has four electron domains. Three of them are lone pairs, non-bonding electrons, and then there's one bonded pair of electrons. Looking at boron trifluoride, it has three domains, one for each of the bonds. Remember how we talked about that boron is going to violate the octet rule. It's hypervalent, or excuse me, hypovalent and has too few electrons. Then if we look at ozone as well, ozone has a lone pair in the central atom. And then in this representation, we have single bond, double bond. When you actually look at ozone, we know that there is actually a resonance form. And so in reality, we have partial double bond character throughout. Regardless of which resonance form you draw, or if you draw the composite, you should get the same number of electron domains, which is three. 
we use another term for these domains. We refer to it as the steric number. So the steric number is the total number of electron domains for a given element. And it's important to realize that we have to talk about this one element at a time. We sometimes use the abbreviation SN for steric number. So when you take a look at the fluorines here, they've got four electron domains, whereas the boron only has three electron domains. So we can't talk about a molecule's steric number or electron domains, but only a given element within a molecule. All right, pause the video and see if you can solve this problem on your own, and then come back. Welcome back. How many electron domains are around the central chlorine and ClO2? The answer is four. For each bond, there is an electron domain. It doesn't matter whether it's a single or a double bond. For each unpaired electron, that's an electron domain. And for each lone pair, that's an electron domain. So the answer there is four. So now that we've been introduced to the idea of steric numbers and electron domains, we're going to use this to determine what's called the electron domain geometry. And the electron domain geometry dictates the overall shape of a molecule around a central atom. Remember that the electron domains repel each other. They have to stay as far away as possible while still being bound. And so we see what are what are called canonical electron domain geometries. This means that these are the most common or the, the, the standards, if you will. So what we see here, these are representations of molecules using balloons. And it actually does a really good job of modeling what we see in the laboratory. And so not shown is the central atom, if you will. But the behavior of the balloons in these examples here demonstrates what we have in the electron domain geometries. So if we have a steric number of two, or two electron domains, then that's going to produce a linear electron domain geometry. Again, that's as far away as the balloons can be from each other. If we have three balloons, then they have to be in a trigonal planar electron domain geometry. Four is what we call tetrahedral. Five is trigonal bipyramidal. And you'll notice here that what we have is a trigonal base and two pyramids, hence the name trigonal bipyramidal. And then finally, if we have six domains, then that is an octahedral electron domain geometry. So tetrahedral, uh, or linear, trigonal planar, and trigonal bipyramidal probably make a little bit of sense when you take a look at the shapes. But you might be wondering, why do we call the other ones tetrahedral and octahedral? Well, let's take a look at what a tetrahedron and an octahedron are. They're actually uh, similar to each other. A tetrahedron you can think of as kind of a trigonal based pyramid. But when you take when you when you um, when we look at the central atom of a tetrahedral molecule, it's actually raised up off the floor. And I'll show you what that uh, I'll show you here what I mean by that. So if this is our central atom, we'll just call it A. you've got these other elements that it's bound to, it's raised up. These three are all in one plane together, and the central atom is raised up above them. Uh, a tetrahedron has four faces. It's a polyhedron with four faces. And you can't see it here in this image, but we have one, two, three, and then the fourth face on the bottom. An octahedron has eight faces. It looks essentially just like 
a square-based pyramid that has uh, on the top and the bottom. And so that's what an octahedron is. If you've ever been to the Louvre in Paris, then that's what that what you might recognize there is an octahedron. And so when you look at the shape of the octahedral, if we were to draw faces, geometric faces on them, we would have four on the top and then four on the bottom, giving us an octahedron. And you can actually see that quite well in this image. Here's the tetrahedral where you can see that the central atom is raised up above the other two. So again, this, this page is just summarizing for you the canonical geometries that you'll be expected to know. I'm not going to say much more about them right now other than that you need to know them. And the more that you work with them, the more they will make sense. Again, these angles come from the fact that the electrons are repelling each other, and this is as far away as they can be from each other. Now that we have an idea of the electron domain geometries, we can talk about molecular geometries. And these are defined by the locations of the bonding atoms. To determine the molecular geometry, we need to first draw the Lewis structure. Then we count up the electron domains and determine the electron domain geometry. Sometimes you'll see this referred to as the EDG, whereas molecular geometries are sometimes referred to as MG. Remember that single, double, and triple bonds count as a one domain, and a lone pair also counts as one domain. Single, L, single electrons as well, but we hardly ever see those. Then we focus only on the atoms, the bonding electron pairs, to determine the molecular geometry. And what we see is that because we can have, or we can have multiple molecular geometries for a given electron domain geometry. So when we look at the tetrahedral arrangement of four electron domains within a tetrahedron, we can remove one or two bonds and replace them with lone pairs, and it produces a different three-dimensional shape. Notice that the direction of the four domains does not change. We still must maintain the maximum angular distance between the lone pairs and the bonding electrons. But if you ignore the space that's occupied by the lone pairs, it looks like a different structure. So in other words, if we were to ignore this, we have a trigonal pyramid. If we ignore these two, it looks, it is a bent molecule. The linear electron domain geometry only has one molecular geometry. If there's only two atoms in the molecule, then it has to be linear. So if you look at diatomics, hydrogen, oxygen gas, fluorine gas, etc., those are all linear. Because again, we're, what we're doing is we're describing the bond angle between them. If we were to, again, if we remove this, this and only have two, even if there is a lone pair on the end, the molecules molecular geometry will be linear. This is a good time to talk about how lone pairs need more space than shared pairs. So within a bonding electron pair, the electrons are housed in between the nuclei. But for a non-bonding electron pair, there's no nucleus on the other side to keep them bound within a certain region. And that allows those electrons to, to occupy more space and, in order to become more diffuse and more uh, and farther away from each other. What this does is this causes the bond angles to deviate from their ideal values. 
So we would expect a bond angle of 109.5, and those bond angles shrink because the electrons are repelling the nuclei. And they're pushing them in towards each other. Multiple bonds have a similar effect. Double and triple bonds have greater electron density in one area, which means that they can repel the opposing elements. And so bond angles that include multiple bonds, in other words, these ones, we'll call those A, and on the other side, we'll call that B, those are larger. And that's because what's happening is the, the electrons here are occupying more space, and they push the elements that, that are across from them closer to each other. And that makes this bond angle smaller. So it's a similar effect as the lone pairs. When looking at trigonal planar electron domain geometries, there's two possibilities. You have trigonal planar and bent. And you'll notice that the, con the approximate bond angle is 120 degrees in both cases, but it's smaller here, again, because of the lone pairs of electrons that have repelled the atoms away from the electrons and towards the atoms. For tetrahedral electron domain geometries, there are three possibilities. Tetrahedral, trigonal, pyramidal, and bent. And again, we see the trend where the bond angle is decreasing as we increase the number of lone pairs. A word about this notation, this AXE, A is referring to the central atom, X is the exterior atoms, and then E refers to the number of lone pairs. So one central atom, four exterior atoms, no lone pairs versus one central atom, three exterior, excuse me, exterior atoms, and one lone pair, and then two of each. If we have five electron domains, that produces a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry. And now there are some important differences in where we would put the, electron dom the electrons if we replace bonds with electrons. And that's because we have two different types of sites. Ones that are axial, think of the top, the North Pole, and the South Pole, and then the equatorial bonds. And it's 90 degrees from an axial to an equatorial, but 120 degrees from equatorial to equatorial. And that means then that the electrons prefer the equatorial position. It's less crowded from other electron domains. If we were to put the lone pairs on the axial, then we would have, then it would have be 90 degrees from three elements. Whereas if we have a single lone pair, then it's 100, it's 90 degrees to two and 120 to two. And that ends up minimizing the repulsions of the electrons. So applying that, we can look at four possibilities for molecular geometries for the trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry. Those are called the seesaw, the T-shaped, and the linear domain, or linear geometries. Again, when the, the 90 degrees are referring from axial to equatorial, Hundred and twenty is equatorial to equatorial, and then one eighty is, is from axial to axial. And you'll notice that adding the lone pairs of electrons has the same effect as it squishes these bonds closer in towards each other and reduces the bond angles. The final type of electron domain geometry and its associated molecular geometries is octahedral. We have six total domains, but we only end up with two sets of lone pairs maximum. 
And the reason for this is because it's simply um, too repulsive for elect to have more than th two sets of lone pairs on an octahedral arrangement. The molecule won't be, we don't uh, see it, it's not stable enough. And so something to note here is that for the square planar, initially the all the elements are equivalent. They're all 90 degrees or 180 degrees from each other. And so it doesn't matter where the lone pair of electrons might go. But for the second one, the lone pair does need to go on the opposite sides. And the name square planar will imply that. In the ebook and on this slide is a summary of all of the electron domain and molecular geometries. So these are both electron domain and molecular geometries here. And then these are also molecular geometries. And you're, you'll be expected to be, be familiar with these enough to be able to use them, recognize when you have, uh, have a Lewis structure or if you're given a molecular formula, to be able to draw it out, draw it in its three-dimensional shape, give it its name, and we will soon use this to talk about chemical properties such as polarity. We can apply the Vesper rules to larger molecules with multiple central atoms as well. So if we take a look at any one of these, then we can count it up. Now remember how we talked about when looking at skeletal structures that hydrogens are only shown when they're bound onto heteroatoms. What that means then is we've got two hydrogens on that carbon as well in order to satisfy its valence and, and form four bonds. That means then that we've got four electron domains and this is tetrahedral. If we look at this carbon atom, it's going to have one, two, three electron domains. And so it's going to be trigonal planar. For nitrogen here, remember, and lone pairs. are not shown. And so nitrogen has, if we draw this out, one, two, three bonds. It needs a set of lone pair electrons. And that gives it a total of four electron domains. But three of them are bonding. That means that we have a trigonal pyramidal electron domain geometry. This last one is oxygen. Oxygen is going to normally form two bonds, which means that it needs two sets of lone pair electrons. It has four electron domains, but only two of them are bonding, which means that it is bent. That's it for the content of this video. The next few minutes are going to be looking at some more practice problems. So you're welcome to watch that and practice along with us. What are the approximate values for the indicated bond angles 1, 2, and 3 in vitamin A molecule shown below? I recommend pausing the video and trying this on your own. Welcome back. So you might be wondering, why do we have a picture of a little bunny here eating some carrots? Vitamin A molecule um, is related to beta carotene, which um, is found in high abundance within carrots. Um, and it's a really interesting molecule. We won't talk about much about it today, but it's essential for our ability to see. So let's take a look at the bond angles here. If we're looking at what you need to do for all of these is to is to make sure that you have the proper number of electron domains. So we need to count them. Okay, what I'm doing here is drawing out anything that's hidden. 
which in this case was a hydrogen atom on number one, two hydrogen atoms on number two, and then the lone pairs for element number three. We then count up the number of electron, we, we want to count up the number of electron domains. We have three electron domains. For At two, we have four electron domains. And three, we have four electron domains. So we're going to expect to see, oops, approximately 120, and then both of these are approximately 109.5. So that only helps us to eliminate choice A, choice D. Now it's a question of what's the effect of the other, of the lone pairs and the double bond. Remember that double bonds, they compress the bonds on opposite sides. So these are going to be less than 120 degrees. Whereas if we have lone pairs of electrons, we achieve a similar effect where those lone pairs are repelling the bonds, the electrons within the bonds, and that gives them less than their ideal as well, so less than 109.5. Now, where you want to pay careful attention is that number one, we're not looking well, this bond angle is less than 120. We're looking at this bond angle, which means that this is greater than 120 degrees. And that gives us then answer choice of E. Okay, for this last question, which shape reflects the electron domain geometry of the central iodine in triiodide? So the first step for this is to draw the Lewis structure. We need to do that by counting up the number of valence electrons. You draw a, single bond, a central element with single bonds between it. In this case, it doesn't matter because they're all iodine. Distribute the electrons, and when you count them up, we have everyone satisfied. But how many lone pairs do we have? We need 22 electrons, and we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Not quite enough. So what we need to do is, is put the extra electron on the central atom. Remember, elements that are in the third row or below, specifically nonmetals, can be hypervalent and have more than 8 electrons. In that case, then, we have a total of one, two, three, four, five electron domains, two bonding domains, and three non-bonding domains. That then is going to be a linear shape overall with an electron domain geometry of trigonal bipyramidal. linear molecular geometry with an electron domain geometry that's trigonal bipyramidal. Be careful here, we're looking for the electron domain geometry and so that's going to be B. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. If you have questions, ask on Piazza and office hours or recitation.